I had a lot of really lonely moments while I was living in my camper. I felt like a complete outsider. I moved to Nashville and I thought, man, everybody there is going to sound like me. Everybody's from the country. Everybody's here to sing country music. And the truth is, Lady She's nominated for the first time this year in six different categories, more than any other artist. Today's guest is Lainey Wilson. I would consider myself a hillbilly hippie. I'm all about peace and love until you push my buttons and then it's game on. Once you signed with a label, did that change everything all of a sudden? I mean, did it feel like that just, it just supercharged things very quickly after all, all of those deals were signed? Absolutely not. It was six or eight months before Things A Man Ought To Know went number one. I believe it was $26 in my bank account. You know, everybody thinks when you sign a record deal that you're doing fine, and everybody thinks when you sign a publishing deal that, oh, she ain't hurt. But that's not the truth at all. We're just out here trying to pay our bills just like everybody else. So, um, yeah, I was I was definitely thinking. Lainey, let me start, start let's, let's sort of kind of start at the beginning. Yeah. You grew up in, a, in a, I guess, a, a pretty small place in Louisiana, Baskin, um, is, is a very small place, right? 250 people. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me, tell me about Baskin, Louisiana. Probably 190 um, now. But yeah, it's, it's actually called the Village of Baskin. If you've ever heard of Monroe, Duck Dynasty, um, that show. I don't know if you ever, if you ever watched yep. that one, but that should explain a little of bit course. as to why I sound the way that I do. But um, very blue collar town, um, not even a stoplight. We have a caution light, and that's about it. You see a lot of cornfields. All 200 people are, are pretty much family, and that's a, a blessing and a curse. They're there when you need them, and they're there when you don't need them. So, um, but I, I love where I'm from, and I, I truly think, you know, being from, from such a small town like that, there's not a whole lot to do. Um, except for sit around and, and tell stories and hear the same old stories that you've been hearing for years, but the, the kind that gets better every time you hear them or every time you tell them. And I think that's really, you know, being from Baskin is, is what made me want to be a storyteller. So you knew everybody growing up and they all knew you. Oh my gosh. We knew too much about each other. It was, (laughs) um, we were we were thick as thieves. I mean, and they still treat me the exact same way. When I come home for Christmas or or Thanksgiving or whatever it is, when I stop by, they treat me like little Laney. They're like, you're not that cool. Just remember where you come from. So I've got a, a lot of people keeping me humble. <laughs> um, your dad was, maybe still is, uh, a farmer. Your mom mm-hmm. was a teacher. Tell me about, about his work when you were a kid. What, what, did, what did he do? My daddy is still the hardest worker I know. Um, he, I remember being a little girl and he was up before the sun and he would come in the house when the sun went, like the sun had to be down before he even came in and ate supper. We were eating supper at nine, ten o'clock at night because he was just a very, very busy man. Um, when I tell you he is, he's one of those kind of guys that if he don't know how to do it, he's going to figure it out. And... I think I just get it honest. I really do. And my mama is the same way. My mama's a teacher and she's just got a heart of gold and she uh, is a a very passionate person. She has a big old heart and um, I am who I am because of the people who raised me. There is no doubt about that. I am who I am because of the folks who raised me, but also the town that raised me. Lenny, when you were a a girl, um, tell me about the music you listened to at home. What What were your parents playing? My goodness. Well, where I'm from, I did not even realize as a little girl that country music was a genre. I thought it was a way of life. I mean, we eat, sleep, and breathe these songs. Um, You know, I grew up in the 90s. I was born in 92. And, of course, voices like Leanne Womack, um, Tim McGraw. Tim McGraw actually grew up right down the road from me. And my step-grandmother used to babysit him and... um, as a little girl, I kind of looked at him and was like, man, Tim McGraw is, is from my neck of the woods, and he did it. Maybe I can do it, too. Um, it, it was one of those situations where I just thought, man, I didn't know anybody around here could do anything like that. You know, so it kind of that is the beginning of, I think, the stars were kind of put in my eyes, and I knew that it was actually possible. So as a little girl at home, you were the kind of kid who would just sing all the time. 
I would not shut up. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm, I mean, I was in the middle, before the Walmart kid was a Walmart kid, I was in there singing in front of, every, my mom was like, hey, Lainey, sing that new song that you just wrote at nine, ten years old, and um, I'd have a crowd of folks at Walmart putting on a show. Um, but yes, I, I remember nine years old, just had written my first few songs, and there was a grand opening for a convenience store that was opening in Baskin, um, owned by a guy named Jerry Cupid, who actually um, ended up helping me later on in life and was kind of my mentor growing up. Um, he was opening this convenience store, and he said, Lainey, would you like to come down and, and sing a few songs a cappella, and I'll pay you 20 bucks. And I said, count me in. I didn't know that I could sing and also make money, too. <laughs> I guess you were nine years old um, when the first time you went to visit the Grand Ole Opry in Nashville. Um, did you guys drive out there as a family? Can you tell me what you remember about that trip? Yeah. Um, nine years old, we took a family vacation. Um, it was a miracle getting Daddy out of the field and into a vehicle to drive to Gatlinburg, Tennessee. That was a long way from northeast Louisiana. So I remember just being so excited and on our way back home to Louisiana, I remember asking him, I was like, what do y'all think about driving through Nashville? Because I knew, you know, we were in Tennessee. It, we might could just make a little pit stop. And um, I remember a guy being on I-40, nine-year-old Laney in the back seat on the interstate. I was looking at the Batman building, and I had this overwhelming feeling Um and it's crazy to think that a nine-year-old could could really have that feeling, but I, I had it. It was it was like a knot in my stomach. Um, it was like the Holy Spirit, and it just came over me. And I, I remember telling my parents, I said, "This is home." I just knew it. I said, "This is this is home. This is where I'm gonna be." Um, and that's crazy coming from, you know, I'm I'm from I'm from Baskin. <laughs> Nobody ever leaves. Uh, maybe one person has has ever left, and. I remember my mama kind of turning around to the back seat, and she's like, Lainey, you're my baby. Like, what are you talking about? But I think in that moment, too, that my parents knew that I was not playing. And when they took me to the Grand Ole Opry that night, we saw Bill Anderson, um, Crystal Gale, uh, Little Jimmy Dickens, Phil Vassar. And I remember exactly where I was sitting. I remember looking at that circle on that stage, and... My sister could care less. She was asleep in the pew right next to me while we were watching the show. And I remember also having that crazy feeling of, I am going to do this. I'm going to be on that stage. I still have the little the little ticket stub from the Grand Ole Opry that night. It's something that my parents held on to because I think they knew deep down, wow. too, that one day it was really going to mean something. So wh what did that mean? Were you Did you just – were you playing and practicing – night after night, day after day from that moment on? You know, so I wrote my first song at nine years old. Um, that was the year that I got my first pair of bell bottoms. That's the year I went to Nashville. Um, it seemed like nine years old was just, it was my year. Um, but whenever Daddy showed me a few chords on the guitar a couple years later, it really just, it opened up a whole nother world for me because I was writing these songs a cappella. I was just kind of dreaming up melodies and um and just kind of kind of going with it. But when he showed me literally just two chords, I was like, oh my gosh. Um it was it was a it was an endless it, it just felt like I can do this forever. I'm gonna I'm gonna figure out how to create more melodies and and have more ideas. And um I think learning to play the guitar really did help me with that. But it was um, one of those things where I would go to school and all my friends would be wanting me to sing whatever song I'd written the night before. And of course, I did all the all the things that all the other kids did. Like I, I cheered, I played basketball, I, I played softball, I ran track. But at the end of the day, when I would come home, I would pick up my guitar and I would go to the bathroom where the acoustics were the best. And I would sit in there for hours and hours and hours and write songs. It was it was one of those things that tracked me down and chose me. I had no other option but to do it. So, Lainey, even in high school, when you were in high school, you knew 
that I mean, it, like some kids might might be preparing to go to college, or some people, some of the kids like probably thought, all right, I'll graduate and get a job somewhere. You knew that you weren't preparing for anything else except to leave Baskin mm -hmm. and to and to pursue a career as a as a singer as a performer. I knew it. Um, there has never been a, a doubt in my mind. I knew though that it was not going to be easy. Um, you know, in high school when all of my friends were going to LSU football games and and doing all their, you know, fun things on the weekends, a lot of the times um I was working. I was I impersonated Hannah Montana. That was my middle school through high school job. I had the wig. I had the portable sound system. Um, I would do birthday parties, fairs, festivals. I would open up for myself, like as Lainey Wilson, and then I would go backstage and throw the wig and the outfit on and come out as Hannah Montana. And um, for me, that was not just a paycheck, you know, um, I could have been out there doing what all the rest of the kids were doing. But for me, it was a way for me to get my name out there as Hannah Montana. You know, I'm like, well, they're not going to leave here without knowing my name, too. That's why I opened the show. So you finished high school um, and you didn't hesitate. You like in August of, of, of that year, you finished high school in June. In August, you're in Nashville. You moved to Nashville. You were like 18 years old and you just went there by yourself yeah so long story short remember when i was telling you about the convenience store that was opening in baskin when i was nine years old and he hired me to come sing a few songs acapella um the guy's name was jerry cupid and jerry cupid was also from baskin and had a big dream to move to nashville in the late 70s early 80s and be a producer be a songwriter and my grandfather on my daddy's side, um, he always just supported music, whether that meant he would go to bluegrass festivals or whatever. He just loved, he loved music and he wanted to lift anybody up who had anything to do with it. And my grandfather back in the late seventies gave Jerry Cupid a few hundred dollars to help him move to Nashville and get started. And as a favor in return, years later, every time Jerry would come to Baskin, he would stop by my house and he would listen to the new songs that I had been writing and tell me what to do to fix them, how to make them better. Um, he's really the one that taught me how to write a song and I mean, constructive criticism from, from the get go. And so years later, um, because of what my grandfather did for him, he literally let me live in his studio parking lot here in Nashville for free for the first three years I was living here in my camper and he let me bum water wi-fi electricity lived in a i lived in a camper i lived in a 20-foot flagstaff bumper pool camper trailer in the parking lot of his recording studio in the parking lot of his recording studio so um every morning i would walk out of the camper and i'd go into the studio and we'd write music together and um I, I did that for years. I was not even old enough to go anywhere in Nashville. It was not one of those situations where I could, you know, go to the bar down the road and meet all the local songwriters. Um, Jerry Cupid was the only one I knew. He was the only, like, he was he was my resource. He was uh, my mentor. And like I said, after three years of, of living in my camper in his studio parking lot, he ended up getting sick. And... Um, and he passed away at a at a very young age. And at this point, I'm living in my camper trailer in, in this guy's studio parking lot. I'm like, where do I go? What do I do? He's the only person I, I knew. Um, he's the one that has, has taught me everything I know when it comes to knowing a little bit about this business. And I sold my camper trailer and I, I had to start completely over. And for me, it's never been pack it up and go home. There are definitely times when I should have thrown everything I had back in that camper and took my butt to the house, but I could not do it. There, it was still this deep down calling. It was, it was in my heart. It was in my soul. I, um, I had to do it, whatever that meant, whatever it looked like. I knew if, if that meant it was going to take me 30 years to, to find my way here in Nashville, damn it, I was going to do it. When you got to Nashville, 
as as a you know an eighteen year old kid and those first sort of few years just kind of grinding away, just recording music. Um, what? How did you feel in the city? Did you feel like ah, I'm in, I'm, 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 I'm like here, I'm home, I'm like with my people, um, or did you kind of feel like an outsider, even though you were making country music? That's a great question. Um, I felt like a complete outsider. You know, I moved to Nashville and I thought, man, everybody there is going to sound like me. Everybody's from the country. Everybody's here to sing country music. And the truth is, guy, um. No, I, at that point, I was way too country for country, um, if that makes any sense at all. But it was very scary. I mean, you know, I'm I'm from a town of 200 people where everybody knows everybody. Um, and I, I wanted to make friends. I wanted to create relationships. I wanted to I wanted to, to do all those things. The truth is, I just didn't know where to start. And, you know, looking back on it now, um a lot of it seems like common sense of like, what would you do to, you know, how do I meet more published writers or how do I go about, you know, getting more meetings on Music Row? Um, but I was so clueless. I would walk up and down Music Row with CDs that I had burnt and I would pass them out to people. A lot of times they would slam the door in my face and um, on to the next one. I mean, it was it was it felt like a little bit of a movie. I'm like, this can't be real, <laughs> but, but it was, and it was scary. It was hard. Um, looking back on it, I'm like, dang, um, I was, I was pretty brave. I was, I was putting myself out there and it's something, it's something that looking back on now, I'm really proud of, of younger Laney for doing that. Tell me what you did day after day, you know, from 2011 you know, in those first few years when you were when you were there, you were you were recording music every day. I was writing music every day um, during that time. During 2011 through 2017, I believe I had written about four thousand songs. Um, wow! Some of them will absolutely never see the light of day, but I felt like that was the thing that was keeping my head above water. I had a lot of really lonely moments while I was living in my camper, especially when, um, you know, Jerry was passing away and um, I didn't know where to go, what to do, who to turn to, who to talk to. Um, but yes, it, songwriting, <laughs> songwriting and this business in general is the thing that uh, will kill you, but also keep you alive, if that makes any sense at all. Um, it's it's an it's an obsession, but I'm so thankful for it because it is the thing that that gets me through the hard times. And over and over and over again, I get to go back to it and I get to do it. I'll be 90 years old, still having hard times, but I can still pick up my guitar and a pen and a piece of paper and and write down how I'm feeling. And I'm so thankful that if the Lord was going to give me a gift at all, I'm glad it was that one. Tell me what you were writing about. I mean, what was in your head that you were putting on paper? Because I would imagine these were not happy songs, or or maybe they were. I, I don't know. It's very interesting because uh, my mama and daddy tell me that even when I was 10 years old writing music, that I was writing songs about tequila and cigarettes and all the things that I knew absolutely nothing <laughs> about. Um, I think it's because I listened to country radio a little too much. And I also would eavesdrop on on adult conversations. Um, I feel like a lot of my ideas would come from just hearing people talk. And I didn't, at that time, I didn't specifically have to live it to write it. And I feel like as, as time has gone, and, and I've had the opportunity to write with such incredible writers here in Nashville, they've kind of taught me how to put myself into the shoes of, of whatever it is that we're writing about. Um, if I want to write about this coffee mug right here, they've taught me how to um, get out of my body, get out of my mind, and step into the shoes of, of this coffee mug and, and feel it for everything that it's worth. How is this coffee mug feeling? You know, um, what's it thinking? And that's a really therapeutic thing, especially when you are having those those hard times, every now and then it feels good just just to 
escape and um and that's what songwriting has been for me so during those camper trailer days during those days of of not knowing where to go or what to do or um i would just write to write i would dream up things to write about and that was really um it was my saving grace so really it's like an exercise in empathy like you have to think about somebody's experience, even if it's not your own, and try and bring that to life in words. That's it right there. And I, I truly do think that songwriting has definitely made me more of an empathetic person. And for instance, you know, like say a, a co-writer comes to me and, and they're like, um, this is my idea. This is what I'm going through. Um, when you write a song with somebody, you you really get to know that person and you really create this bond and friendship that you will have for forever because you dive in head first. I'm talking about, you start talking about feelings that um, you've never even told some of your closest, your, your closest people because you want to get the, the best song that you possibly can. But say, you know, a friend comes to me and they have this, this idea of is something that they are specifically going through for those three or four hours or however long it is that that we are writing this song, I'm getting to take some of their burden and put it on me. And it makes them feel like they're not going through it alone. And there's been times when they do that for me. And it, it really is this, this magical, um, man, like, you know, life is hard, but I got people who are going to help me figure it out along the way. And I have I have found those people. And when you do find those people, you better hold on to them. Um, Lainey, I mean, writing 4,000 songs, I mean, what an incredible discipline, right? Because over time, you're going to get better and better. And I wonder, during that, that period of time, I mean, were you also, you know, auditioning for for labels? Were you trying to get your foot in the door in front of managers? Were you... Did you have any success getting in front of anybody at all? When I was 19 years old, uh, when Jerry Cupid was still alive, uh, we had we had recorded, I believe, like 10 songs, and he got me he got me several meetings with some big labels in town. I think I met with Sony. I think I met with Warner, um, maybe Big Machine, and I thought this is it. I mean, I'm ready, you know, like I'm, I'm about yeah. to get me, a, I'm about to get me a record deal. Uh, even the first time that I went to CMA Fest in, at 14 years old in Nashville, I was watching all of these shows and I'm, and I'm like, I'm ready. Um, the truth, uh, truth is I was nowhere near ready. I had not lived enough life at the time to tell the kind of stories that I was supposed to tell. And I'm a, I'm a very firm believer in that, that I was supposed to go through some, through, through some stuff before, um, it was believable and it was you know we go into these meetings you hope for the best you come out you don't hear anything and i knew at that point i was like okay well that means that i've got to dig deeper i've got more work to do it took me years it took me about seven or so years of being in nashville before i found my manager mandolin monchik um and she's one of my very best friends. She has helped me bring all of these things to life. She has believed in me at times more than I believed in myself. And it takes surrounding yourself with those kind of people to lift you up and, and help you over that wall. And one by one, I have found my team, whether it's my, my publishing company, um, and then signing a record deal in 2018, it took time to, to find the people who loved me for me and wouldn't want to change anything about me. Instead, they want to take what I do and um, and help elevate that. And the truth is, guy, I have a really hard time being anything other than myself. And I think that's why time is a, a big part of my story. I'm, I'm wondering how you persevered over that seven-year period. I mean, you did release two records. Mm -hmm. They were... Um, and one of them, your the second one, tougher, actually charted on the on the Billboard chart, um, Billboard country charts. But still, they were you were not signed to a major label, you didn't have a manager, and so I wonder during that seven year period, right, when you're mm -hmm. really trying, this is what you're trying to do. You're trying to get a label to sign you. You're trying to get a manager. You're trying to become a star, 
and it's seven years in. And what prevented you from giving up? I mean, was there ever a moment where you thought, I better just find a different career because this might not work out? There were times where I should have thought, man, it's time for me to hang it up. It's time for me to to think about maybe just, you know, going home and playing music at at some of the, you know, the Pickle Barrel and in Monroe. And um, I could still have fun with it. You know, maybe I could go be a teacher and I could still do that. But I still had a very supportive family. Um, My mama, she has encouraged me from the beginning i think her and my daddy both knew too um that people were gonna think we were crazy (laughs) i mean for for sticking this through like i have um i mean totally yeah any parents um you know like they're sending their kids off to college and whatever they're probably like you know well when are they going to tell Lainey to bring her butt to the house when are they going to tell her okay enough is enough stop living in a dream world um But nothing about this has been a dream world. If anything, it has been the complete opposite. Um, But the things that kept me going was that weird sense of peace, that weird feeling that I got at nine years old when I came to Nashville for the first time. Uh, When I went to the Grand Ole Opry, that is the moment that I always go back to. I'm like, no, 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 no. Like, no. I was given this gift, and this gift might not be for everybody, but it is for somebody. And at that point in time, when I when I couldn't get a manager, when I couldn't find a label, when I couldn't find a publishing deal, um, for me, I was like, okay, well, I'm going to go out and I'm going to play as many shows as I possibly can. I had the mentality of, okay, one fan at a time. If I can find one person who is interested in what I'm wow. saying and what I'm singing about, then they're going to go tell their sisters. They're going to go tell their brothers. They're going to tell their mama and daddy. And um, that is how, those are the things that kept me going. I was like, wow. okay, one person, one person is interested in what I have to say. Um, next thing you know, 10 people. Next thing you know, 20 people. And yeah, it's it's just kind of like you, you take what you get, if you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. So you would you would play like small venues all over, just all over the South mainly, and you would sell your, your record after the show? You'd sell your albums? I would go play three or four hour shows um, out of high school into college as well. I was playing with a band called the Cadillac Kings. We were playing four hour shows. Um, Every now and then they'd let me get up there and do an original song. And that was kind of my way of like testing the waters to see if if anybody was interested in what I had to say. And um, then the next show, I'd play a different one just to kind of test the waters, see if they were interested in what I had to say. And I just kept doing it and kept doing it. And um, yeah, it's uh, it honestly kind of makes you sound a little bit like a psychopath when I really sit back and think about it. <laughs> no, but I mean, it's it's amazing. Seven years after your arrival, you know, seven years of living in a three years of living in a trailer in a parking lot and Mm -hmm. set, but really seven years of just trying to get a deal because, but at the same time, during that period of time, you just didn't stop. You didn't stop writing. You didn't stop performing. And, and I, I wonder how you kept your, your spirits up. How did you, how did you stay positive and focused? Because that requires so much discipline to keep going. I mean, I mean, the, yeah. the there is there are tens of thousands of people that we don't even know about mm-hmm. who've tried to do this in Hollywood or in Nashville, who just gave up because it didn't work. And some of them might have been superstars, but but how did you stay positive during that time and not anxious or depressed or sad or lonely or all those things? Uh, you know, I, I definitely had had seasons of anxiety and depression. Um, But I would always say I went into this this record label and I had a meeting. Um, And they passed on me. They said, no, you know, not right now. Go go work a little harder and then come back several years, blah, 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 whatever. I always had the mentality of, okay, I would never have gotten this meeting if it was going to always be a no. I would have never met this person if it was always going to be a no. 
at some point in time, somebody is going to say yes. Um, I did not know when. And it took me a lot longer than a lot of folks. I mean, I, I would see people move to town and they'd be here for a month and get a dang record deal. But I also know yeah, from watching my daddy, um, from watching him get up every day, do the same thing, farming, plant it, water it, take care of it day in and day out. A tornado could roll through and wipe it all away. At the end of the day, it's his livelihood. It's what he loves. And I relate it back to what I do. I would consider myself a song farmer. Um, it's what I do. And that was it. That was it. I knew that I had to take care of it. I knew that there was going to be bad times. There was going to be good times. Um, but if you want something, it's up to you to go get it. And so I would take these no's and I would turn them into yeses somehow. And um, and I think it was just finding finding the right people. I think it was finding the people, like I said earlier, who who loved me and believed in in me and my story. Did at, once you signed with a label and you had a publishing deal and a management deal, did that change everything all of a sudden? I mean, reading about you and sort of and you know reading interviews that you've given and your it seems like it happened quickly, but I wonder if it felt differently because you know the single was released and then you go on tour with Morgan Wallen in twenty nineteen. Did it did it feel like that just it just supercharged things very quickly after all all of those deals were signed? Absolutely not. I knew that when I signed my name on that dotted line, <laughs> that that's truly when the hard work began. Um, and I knew that going into it, I was like, okay, I have been preparing for the race. I now have entered the race, and now I'm about to run it. Um, so I was like, okay, now now is when it counts. I've been over here just kind of doing what I love for years, you know, trying to make ends meet or whatever. But now the pressure's on. Game is on. And um, I wouldn't even say that I'm a competitive person with other people, but I am very competitive with myself. I'm hard on myself. I mean, when I walk off the stage and I feel like I didn't do as good as I wanted to, um, I'll beat myself up for a minute and I'll figure out what I can do to make it better the next time. But that's just that's just the kind of person I am. So we sign these record deals. We sign these publishing deals. I have never worked harder in my life at that point. That's when I was like, OK, well, now I have an opportunity to work with a producer that I've been dreaming about working with, um, Jay Joyce, and somebody that, you know, I heard was unreachable. When I signed my record deal, they were like, I, I don't know if that's going to be possible. Um you know, getting to work with him. I, I think that, you know, he only works with a select few people. Um, well, I did my magic on the other end. I had a friend who knew Jay Joyce, and every time he would go over um, to Jay's house, his name is Frank Romano, he would he would bring up my name to Jay and kind of plant those seeds. And eventually Jay is like, well, who is this girl, and why do you keep talking about her? Maybe I need to meet her. <laughs> so Jay ends up reaching out to me and says, hey, would you like to come by the studio? And he has this old renovated church with stained glass windows and he has and he's turned it into a studio and he's got these two 150 pound Great Danes that just walk around. They look like little miniature horses. And um, I go over, I bring him coffee and I was I was fully expecting to pull out a guitar and play him a song and see if he was interested in maybe working together. But I come in, he's smoking a cigarette right there in the middle of the sanctuary, and I thought, man, this is my kind of people right here. He just, he just doing, doing what he wants to do, how he wants to do it. And um, we got to know each other. We, we sat there, we, we talked about the way that I grew up, the way that I was raised, what I grew up listening to. We talked about his story, what brought him here. He really took the time to get to know me. And he took the time to get to know my personality. And a few weeks later, he asked, hey, do you want to come back over to the studio? And I stopped by, I bring him coffee again. I never play any music at all. I go home. A few weeks later, I come back by again. And this time, he throws me a guitar. And he's like, let me hear what you got. Wow. And at that point, I was thinking, well, I thought we were just hanging out, you know. And um, I play him like a song and a half. And 
you know, I, I, we, I stop, we talk a little bit more about life and I leave. And later that day I called and I said, you know, I don't, I don't know what you had in mind, but I know what I have in mind. You know, I'm getting ready. I just signed this record deal and I'm getting ready to make a record. And, um, I look up to you a whole lot and I, there's a whole lot that I want to learn from me. And he said, you just let me know when. And so that was it. So I got to go back to the label and say, you know, I've, I've actually talked to him. So we got to, we got to figure this out. You know, we got to figure out how to come up with the funds to do it. And, uh, we did it. And I have, I have found a producer that gets it that gets what I do. He gets what bell bottom country is. Um, he knows who I am deep down because he, he took the time to get to know me before he said, yes, this is something that, that I want to do. Um, I always say I want to be the worst one in the room, whether it's in the writing room or in the studio, because I want to leave there feeling like I learned something. And every time I'm in the room with Jay Joyce, yeah, I learn. I love that idea that you want to be the worst one in the room because then you know you're learning from great people around you and it's how you get better. So Jay, Jay agrees to work with you. And mm -hmm. I mean, this really, you know, I, I mean, I think the, the song that m people who know your music, the song that they really, many people first heard, heard was Things a Man Ought to Know. Yes. I think was number one country airplay track it was a number three chart charts on the country music charts it was a huge hit i mean all of a sudden you start to get lots of attention you're getting mm -hmm. attention and all, all over spotify and apple music and um i mean that became a really big breakout single and um tell me about about that song and about how, writing that song and and the process of of bringing it to life did you know that was going to be the breakout song? I had no clue. I had no clue. The truth is, Guy, we had, when we were getting ready to do this record with Jay, the same what I'm thinking record, we went through 500 songs. We had dwindled it down to 500. And then we had dwindled it down to 200. And then we dwindled it down to 50. And then I ended up with 12 songs. And I felt like, okay, these are the songs right here that are saying what I'm thinking. And we had covered all those bases. About two weeks before I go into the studio, um, I was headed home from a co-write. And another one of those crazy feelings, that crazy feeling I told you about at nine years old, I had another one. And it hit me like a ton of bricks. I remember exactly where I was on Dickerson Pike in Nashville. And it hit me in the stomach and it said, you have got to record things a man ought to know. It was not even on the list. I don't even think it was on the like top 20 list that we had. But I called, I called Mandolin, my manager, and we ended up, you know, calling the label too, because it was signed, sealed, delivered. We knew exactly what we were cutting. And we called and said, yeah. you know, we've got to make room for things a man ought to know. I don't know why. Um, but we just have to. And when we got into the studio, I knew it was a, a, a special song, but I didn't know that this was going to be the one that really did kind of lay that lay that foundation for what I wanted to, to build off of. And I'm so glad that it was this one because this song is who I am. Um, this song is how I was raised. My parents made dang sure that that I knew how to treat somebody but also how i wanted to be treated and this is not a song about whether you can change a flat tire or start a fire i mean this is a song about um having good character and that right there is not something that that just a man ought to know it's something that we all need to know so i'm glad that that this was the song that introduced me to a lot of folks because you know i've I want to be a light in this world. I want to to show little boys and little girls that you're supposed to work hard, you're supposed to keep your head down, and you're supposed to treat people right. When I read um, reviews of your music, which is re remarkable, I mean, you've been you've received such overwhelming praise for your music from critics. Um, one of the descriptions is like there's a little bit of sort of southern kind of rock and like some classic classic rock and even a little bit of pop but you 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 said this earlier in our conversation and i want to kind of go down this rabbit hole a little bit you call your music bell bottom country um what does that mean to you 
Bell Bottom Country is something that we came up with um, before I even did that first record. It was it was to describe my look, my sound, um, kind of all of it, but also Bell Bottom Country being a being a place. Um, Bell Bottom Country is country with a flair. If that <laughs> you know, wink wink. Um, it's about finding whatever it is about you that makes you different and unique and leaning into it as much as you possibly can. Um, for me, that's that's my story. That's my accent. That's where I'm from. That's even talking about how long it's taken me to get to where I want to be and where I'm still going. Um, it's about encouraging people to step into that and lean into that as much as you possibly can. I, I thought of that. That, that I mean, your, your latest album, of course, is called Bell Bottom Country. And I thought about that idea in the song Hillbilly Hippie because it – it captures those two ideas, right? And I, I wonder if that is, it, I mean, is that a, is that you? Is that a, a sort of a version of you, or, um, is 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 that sort of a description of of who you are in a sense? Absolutely, I would I would consider myself a a hillbilly hippie. Um, there's a line in there that says all peace and love up until I ain't. And that's true. Um, I'm all about <laughs> peace and love until you push my buttons and then it's game on. Um, no, I, I feel like I am, I am a, I'm a hillbilly hippie and I'm proud of that. Actually, I was headed down to Alabama to go pick up my, my French bulldog. Her name is Hippie. And I was writing hillbilly hippie. So that's how she ended up getting the name. <laughs> that's awesome. I have a dog who, for some weird reason, loves French bulldogs. And every time we see them, uh, you know, in the park, they, she just loves them, which just wants to go and sniff their butt. So there you go. <laughs> it's hard That's not to my love dog. a French bulldog. I think 10 years to the day that you left Baskin to move to that camper trailer, you hit um, that single, Things Might Not Know, hit platinum, certified platinum, which is unbelievable. I read somewhere that, like, before that happened, like just before you signed those deals, you had like fifty bucks left or a hundred dollars left in your bank account. Is that is that apocryphal or is that actually true? It was, I believe, about six or eight months before things a man ought to know went number one. That I had I believe it was twenty six dollars in my bank account. You know, everybody thinks when wow. you sign a record deal that you're doing fine. And everybody thinks when you sign a publishing deal that, oh, she ain't hurting. Um, but that's not the truth yeah. at all. We're just out here trying to pay our bills just like everybody else. So, um, yeah, I was I was definitely thinking during that time of my life, it was we were coming out of the pandemic, still in it some. And um, it was hard times. I was not able to go play shows and make any money i mean it was i was just living off of what i had and uh, a little bit of that publishing draw and times were rough but i knew it was just right around the corner i knew that uh you know my sister had to venmo me 200 bucks so i could go to taco bell that that night but <laughs> but times are different now I had to do it you had to make it you had no choice I had no choice. I still have no choice. I feel like I'm going to be 90 years old, still still writing, still doing something, I'm still being creative. That's what I've learned is uh, whether it's in the acting world with Yellowstone or whatever it is, I just, I really like, I enjoy stepping outside of my comfort zone. I do. I enjoy feeling like I'm learning and growing and creating something from scratch that is going to live longer than me. That's that's the cool part about all this. It's like what we're creating right now. Even even me and you talking right now. This is going to live longer than we are. Yeah, I hope so. That's how I I think of of interviews because um, they're they're stories that are timeless. Um, Lainey, you really. I mean, it. You know, you. <laughs> this is amazing. In I think it was in twenty twenty two. You got six nominations at the Country Music Association Awards. Um, I mean, there are only a few artists who, who've received six or more nominations as a first-time nominee. It's like legends. Glenn Campbell, Casey Musgraves, Brad Paisley, Lenny Wilson. Now you're in that 
you're in that group of people who've, who who first time nominees with six or more nominations. Mm-hmm. When you when you when you heard of that, when you heard that, because you you know this now, mm-hmm. when you first heard that, what what do you remember? How do you remember responding to that idea? I mean, did you even have a chance to kind of just reflect on that at all? I remember well. I remember hearing the name Glenn Campbell and, and about falling out of my seat because my granny tells me the story about my daddy that he used to roll a picnic table out to the side of the highway in Baskin and stand on top of it with his guitar and pretend that he was Glenn Campbell when he was a little boy. And so it was a full circle, just like, oh, my gosh. Um, you know, my daddy, he, he had a little bit of this dream when he was a little boy, and now he's kind of getting to live vicariously through me. And now now my name is in the same sentence as Glenn Campbell talking about the CMAs. That's That's huge. I will tell you, though, you know, I, I, I didn't start doing this and I didn't move to Nashville and I, I haven't been here for 12 years just to win the awards. You know, I like that wasn't even on my radar when I was writing a song at nine years old. I was doing it because I had to. I was doing it because I felt it in my soul. But it is really cool to be acknowledged. It's one of those things where it's like, Oh my gosh, my peers, um, you know, people who I have, I've worked really hard at creating these friendships and relationships with other artists and people within the industry because I knew that in the beginning, they might not remember my song or they might not remember it, anything like that or my songwriting, um, but they're going to remember how I made them feel. And when you have the support of of the country music industry, you have their support. They're not one leg in, one leg out. They love you. And they have lifted me up. Um, they have, they've, they believe in me. And because I have the support of all of my country music peers, you know, um, that gives you that extra confidence of like, yes, I can do this. People who I look up to are cheering me on. Like, yes, I can. There's no doubt that I can do this. I wonder how you – I mean you now have had some success and a lot and a lot of attention. So how do you make sure that you stay – you know, you stay hungry, you stay engaged and, you know, like like this could all, you know, mm-hmm. like like it could all go away. How do you How do you keep yourself motivated to keep pushing and to keep – writing and to keep getting better and to keep growing you know i i go back to being from a farming community i I truly do just because my daddy has a good crop one year does not mean that he's going to work less hard the next um that's just not how it goes i'm always going to be that little girl who has stars in my eyes i'm telling you that's just the way that it's going to be um um, and, and there's times where I'm like, you know, I don't, I don't want anybody thinking that I'm not like content or satisfied with where I'm at or anything like that. But, um, there's a lot of things that I want to do. There's a lot of things that I want to accomplish. And for me, the things that keep me going are knowing that I have a lot of little girls and a lot of little boys watching my every move right now. And that is a big responsibility, but I want them to know that you can't just sit on your hands and wait for things to happen. You have got to dig in. You have, like, don't take no for an answer. If, if they tell you no, that ought to make you want it that much more. And so those are the things that are inspiring me now to keep on going. Lainey, thank you so much. Thank you. This was incredible. Hey, it's Guy, and I hope you enjoyed this conversation. For more like it, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. And for the audio version, just open up your favorite podcast app, search for The Great Creators, and tap follow.